you know, when Hitler came to power in Germany, um, the, the Dutch government uh, asked my father to head an organization to help German refugees who were fleeing from Hitler's Nazi uh, things to um, help these people who arrived in Holland to find them somewhere to live and perhaps even find somewhere to work. Um, so he was, he certainly was well aware you know, from before the war what was going to be happening. Yeah. So, so at that point in the war, the, the Dutch government was working with trying to help people, but That's things right. changed. Yes, when I mean, when the Germans invaded Holland, the Dutch government upped it, came to England you know, with the Queen. Yeah and basically left it to the civil service to sort out what would happen uh, when the Germans invaded. So how much longer did you spend... Were you still at home at this point in Holland? Oh, yes, yes. we were still at home. But one became quite... Um, soon one became aware of the restrictions that came into place. I mean, we were secular Jews, so being a Jew didn't really mean anything to me whatsoever. But, you know, when suddenly... A notice, to, your, to your family, to your parents? No, no we, were all, we were all just secular Jews. But, you know, suddenly a notice would appear on the park that said forbidden for Joden, forbidden for Jews, and suddenly I wasn't allowed to go in there. And all the other children in the street where I lived, this is where we used to play, you know, in the playground, and suddenly I wasn't allowed to go in there because I was a Jew. And I couldn't understand why, you know, I hadn't done anything, I hadn't broken anything. Uh, and, 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 I mean, I mean, relative to what's to follow, this seems a trivial question, but presumably quite upsetting to a small boy that you can't play with your friends. Exactly. And then, you know, then it spread a bit more. You know, I started in my little local primary school. And my primary school was the very first primary school in Europe that looks like what primary schools look like today. It was a very modern, up-to-date place. And suddenly I was taken away from that school purely because I was Jewish and put into an all... Jewish school, which was much more on the sort of Victorian um, system, you know, one desk behind the other. The walls were painted dark brown. The windows were high up, so you could only look see the sky through. It's totally different to the little primary school I just left. At this point, again, not so much your, your view, but from your parents, I'm just trying to get the perspective, because lest we forget, the Allies weren't even aware really that death camps even existed so the, uh, yeah. the lack of information i'm trying to did your parents so you can't play with your friends you can't go to your school mm. you're moved are your parents getting any insight then into what the future might hold well they knew that people were going to east to poland right. and that's about as much as they knew but the thing was you see my father um, joined the Dutch resistance, and he was very much involved in finding hiding places for Jews to hide. And in fact, we even hid Jews in our own home from time to time. You know, Jews hiding Jews is something you very rarely come across. And then one and day, were your houses subjected to searches? No, but not at this. Point. No, not at this stage. Um, but, but basically, he'd been betrayed, and uh, one day he went went to work, to to his work in in the centre of Amsterdam. And of course, by that time, he had to walk. He was, he was refused to public transport and um, never came back. He was then taken to the SS headquarters on the Vetering Schans. There he was, we presume, was tortured. From there he was taken to the notorious Amersfoort prison where again he was tortured. Um, and then from there to Westerbark and from Westerbark to Auschwitz. At, the, at this point, when you're still a boy in, in Holland, you, yeah. your father's just disappeared. Presumably you don't know anything about no, what had happened. No, no. My mother certainly knew where, where okay. he was, but we didn't. In fact, my mother, again, showed incredible um, resistance and bravery. She found out when he was in prison um, and uh, who the cleaners were, and she actually went into that prison disguised as a man. Scrubbing How the floors. amazing. And briefly saw my father, who told, him, who told her he'd been tortured, but he hadn't given anything away. And that was the last time How she saw him. extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And you never saw him again? We never saw him again. No. God. Okay, so... So your mother's found your father. He hasn't given anything away. You never see your father again. Yeah. You're out of school. You're still at home? We're still at home. So what happens next? And then something quite extraordinary happened, which later on in life became much more important to me. Three of my father's friends, who were not Jewish, um, they were all married and had children, um, had responsibilities, petitioned the German authorities for clemency for my father. Now, this was a very dangerous thing to do because they were pleading for a friend uh, to a, an organization that had a fanatical hatred of Jews. And a Jew in the Dutch resistance, you know, made it even worse. And basically, 
they badgered and badgered and badgered, although the Germans wouldn't allow uh, my father to be released. Um, what they did do was, in Holland, that they set up these priority lists for Jews, and we were on one of these priority lists. I mean, to give you an idea, you know, there were 140,000 Jews living in Holland, and 75% of them were killed. And so to stop mass panic among the Jewish population of the Netherlands, they split people up into groups, promising all sorts of things, which, of course, were never kept. Such as? Um, um, for example, some of the Jews could go to the, uh, American, uh, the South American embassies in The Hague and, and buy Paraguayan nationality, then report to the police and say, well, I'm a Paraguayan now, so you know, I'm, I don't have to worry about... Um, I'm interned as a, as a foreigner. So you were somehow protected in that way. We should probably, uh, at this point, just reflect for a moment on why Hitler went after the Jews. Because to some people, I mean, when I was growing up, it was inexplicable to me. My first exposure to the Holocaust was uh, the world at war, uh, when we saw the, the, the mm. footage of bulldozers and the likes, which we'll, we'll get to in the death camps. But it was, it was in, inexplicable that one race could pick on another race and it was based on centuries worth of, of anti-semitic that's right trope. yeah mm. absolutely true so i'm i'm, I'm I, the way I, I i've been taught it historically is that because of the reparations after world war one where the allies were forcing germany to to pay its share huge amount huge yeah. amounts that yeah. that caused great poverty in germany yeah and that enabled hitler using referenda ironically yeah to unite his people by Let's hatred. Let's make Germany great Wait, again. Well, <laughs> have we heard that before? <laughs> but to unite them yeah. in hate. Yeah. That, that that's, that's, was part of his secret, I think. It was he Absolutely. could unite his mm. people mm. against your people. Yeah. And it was just based on the nonsense of anti-Semitism through the years. That's right, exactly. I mean, it's still, I still, it's, it, just, it just defies comprehension to to someone like me i just I, i've i've never understood racism i was thinking i was associated with racism with poor intelligence and, mm. and uh, i just i just, just find it incredible that, that, that they yeah. that you could persuade one people that another people were the cause of all their problems and when you bear in mind that germany the people of germany they'd won more nobel prizes <laughs> than all the other countries in the world put together at that time there was intelligent there was a background uh, that was explored by philosophers, and I suppose at, at that time we were still exploring concepts of evolution. They were still mm. relatively new, and the notion of sort of Superman of superior beings, uh, yeah. eugenics yeah. again, something that Hitler was uh, exploring mm. in. Mm. So he was obsessed with race. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you were aware that two hundred and fifty thousand Germans, Jews, and others in Germany were were killed in the euthanasia program that the Germans had carried out, you know, because they didn't match up to the Aryan race, which, funnily enough, none of the leaders of the Nazi party did either. Well, I was going to say, Hitler was short and dark, wasn't yeah, he? As opposed exactly. to tall, blonde and blue-eyed, yeah. which is uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the supermensch that, yeah. that he was uh, aiming for. We talked briefly about uh, Hitler and the circumstances under which he managed to unite the people, his people, against the Jews. He... he he gave Germany lots of things as well uh, along the way, didn't he? I mean, we were talking yeah. during the breaks there about things like the autobahns. Mm. And so, yeah. so. He gave them hope. I mean, they were desperate. Inflation was, you know, it was horrendous. If you, you know, you got money on Friday. If you hadn't spent it by Friday evening, it was worth half of what it was when you bought when you originally got it. I mean, it was an absolute shambles. And suddenly, this man comes along and gives them hope. But with that hope comes this evil. You know, the, the problems of Germany. It's all due to the Jews. And a lot of these people just believed him. It's sad. So take us back to um, your situation now in Holland. Your, your yeah. father has disappeared. Yeah. Your mother's seen him, but uh, he, uh, to all intents, he's now gone from your life. When are you moved out of Amsterdam? Well, then what happened was, as a result of these three wonderful men... Um, the ones that were petitioning for clemency. Cle we were petitioning for clemency for my father. Uh, they managed to, with a lot of badgering and pushing, to get us on one of these priority lists... And we were put on one of these lists. It was called the Bernefeld list. And that really saved our lives because, in actual fact, they were the prominent, the prominent people, the prominent Jews, the upper echelons of Dutch Jewish society. 
And it seems, you know, in retrospect, they were using us basically as a sort of political pawn should they need to use us and not send us off to the killing fields straight away. So we were sent to this place called Barnefeld, and that was a castle that the Germans had requisitioned. And, um, you know, that's where we were incarcerated for the first six months, um, having left um, our home in um, March 1943. You started um, our interview by telling us, understandably, that when the Germans first came in, it was all quite fun and exciting. Yeah, it was. What were your feelings at the time you were in the castle? We were frightened. Yeah. Yeah. We were frightened. Um, and but we thought well, at least we're safe here. And in this place, this castle, you know, you could have walked out of the place. There were no guards, okay. there was no barbed wire. But just sheer fear kept you there because we'd been promised we'd not be sent abroad. That was what was special about this this list. So people thought, stay there, keep your head down. Yeah. Hopefully, the war will end and then we'll be able to go back to our homes. Gotcha. Mm. But you weren't there for much we weren't longer. there for long. Six months later, um, the German army stormed in, gave everybody twenty minutes. To pack, and we were sent on the train to Westerbork, and that put the fear of God into everybody. Were you aware of? Uh, I mean, again, it's it's difficult because what what did you know about train journeys for Jewish people at that time? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. We were now, I, as far as I was concerned, I was being moved from one camp to another camp. But Westerbork was very, very different. I mean, this was a, a place that had barbed wire fences around it. It had a moat. It had um, watchtowers on stilts with guards looking down upon you with searchlights. And we were housed in barracks and the conditions were absolutely appalling. You know, there were lice everywhere, scarlet fever and polio and, and, and dysentery, a lot of dysentery. And no us. help. No help. Lice everywhere. But we did not starve in this camp. We were fed, but it was pretty monotonous food. Was your mother working? My mother did, did, did some work there, yes. Um, but basically, we as children were left more or less to ourselves to do what we liked. In fact, we made up an alphabet uh, of of how we saw things. It's called the Westerbark alphabet. And luckily, when we came to England, my mother in 1945 in London made me write this down, which is just as well because nobody else seems to have remembered it. <laughs> um, how long were you there for? We were there for a year, which is an unusually long time. So it was in September 1944. Um, with the Allies now in, in Arnhem, um, that we were put on a transport to this place called Theresienstadt, or Terezin, as it's called in, in the Czech Republic. Um, incidentally, the transport before ours was the one that Anne Frank and Margot and her family were sent, the last transport to go to Auschwitz. Did you know them out of interest? Because I mean, you're both Franks. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I mean, Anne was, you know, she was six years older than me, and at that age, you know, that's a yeah, huge yeah, difference. Yeah. But the interesting thing about that particular transport was my uncle was on that transport, and I can remember him coming to say goodbye to us, and he knew that this was his final <laughs> destination. Mm. So then... Um, how were things there in that camp? Well, I mean, first of all, getting there, you know, 39 hours in a cattle truck. No, no food, sanitation. No sleep, no water. And I remember particularly the stench that built up in the cattle truck. If you could imagine a sort of mixture of human sweat, of vomit, of urine, and the feces, the whole oxygen level within the actual the cattle truck was dropping and dropping. must have been terrified. I mean, it was, absolutely terrified. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. And then suddenly the train stopped and it was dark and I, we heard this sort of great rum as the cattle truck door was slid open. And I can remember so clearly this great waft of ice cold air that came into the cattle truck and suddenly <sighs> we could breathe. It's a bit like, you know, when you dive into a swimming pool, when you get to the bottom, you want to push off and get up yeah. to the top as quickly as you can. Well, it's like that in ultra slow motion. And then we arrived in this place called Theresienstadt or Terezin which was you know, a dreadful place. Um, but it was, again, another transit camp. camp yeah. Basically, we were on our way to, the, to our final destination, which was one of the killing fields in, in Eastern Europe. By that time, of course, it was Auschwitz was the only one that was basically operating. At because that time. because the, the, the Germans were... Yeah, because they were, the they, they were yeah. losing the war by then, you see. Yeah. So d were you aware in this final camp that... When, when, did, you, when, did, when did you get the sense that the Allies Safe, were yeah, that safety was, was on its way. Well, we witnessed the bombing of Dresden. I remember that night, you know, tremendous noise. 
and we thought, my goodness me, what's happening? And the whole sky to the east, to the north of us, was sort of crimson, you know, like you see the sodium lamps in, yeah. in the, on road junctions. And somebody says, it's Light Maritz, the Allies, they're bombing Light Maritz. But in actual fact, it was Dresden, which is about 90 kilometers away to the north. That was getting hammered by the, by the oh, bomb There's a command. lot of bombs to, to be seen bombs. from that yeah. distance. But for us, that was a tremendous sort of um, feeling of, oh, perhaps we are now coming to the end. And we did see planes going over. You know, they had stars under their wings, which was not what we had seen before. Which were the US. Uh, uh, which were the US uh, Air Force, of course. And... Um, the extraordinary thing was, again, my mother, who was so incredibly resourceful, she worked in the camp hospital laundry where she could wash her children's clothes when the authorities weren't looking because that was the only place where there was hot water because typhus was rampant within this camp. People were dying all over the place. And the only way you can keep typhus at bay was to keep yourself clean. And she used to wash adults' clothes and little laundry lists and she would barter that for food. And from time to time, she would come to the children's home where we then were, and she would feed us out of an old aluminium saucepan with one spoon. We still, we still have the saucepan at home. Oh, do you? Yeah, we do. Oh my yeah. God. And Steve, can I ask you Stephen, one thing? Did you ever see any humanity or kindness from any of the Nazis who kept you in prison? No, never. Not even a scintilla? Not at all. I mean, in Vesterborek, I can remember very clearly, I was, I, was, I was on my own. I was wandering. My mind was miles away, probably thinking about, the, you know, before the war. And suddenly I found I'd wandered right up to the perimeter wire. And I suddenly realised I couldn't go any further. And I looked up and there was a guard looking down at me. And I looked behind me and I'd left the barracks behind. I'd wandered over this no man's land. And about 20 metres along the perimeter wire were two German guards with an Alsatian dog. I was petrified. And then they unleashed the dog, oh. and this dog came bounding over to me, and I put my hands in front of my face, and I was bitten all over my arms and my chest and my thighs. And I can still hear these guards laughing at this bit of Jew baiting, oh. you know, this eight-year-old being mauled by this Little dog kid. before they called it off. Were you, were you liberated? Was your camp liberated? By we the, were liberated by the Russians. By and the that, Russians. But that's another very interesting thing, because right near the end of the war, we were the very last place to be liberated. And my mother, returning from the camp hospital laundry, was approached by some Russian prisoners of war who, who begged her to go into their house. And they took her up into the attic where they'd hidden a radio. Would you believe it? A radio. And they knew something was going to be said in English. And my mother heard Winston Churchill over the, you know, the, the BBC service announcing that at midnight that night the war would be over. But there we were, still under German occupation. The gas chambers had been built. The, the maximum throughput, you know, none of this bottlenecks that they had in Auschwitz type thing. So people were petrified. Are we going to be gassed or shot or perhaps a mixture of both? And in the morning, the, the, the Germans had disappeared and the Russians came in and they but didn't did, want to stay. Did they treat you well? The Russians went straight through. They didn't want to be anywhere near us because people were dying like flies of, of diseases, all you know, typhus mainly. And then the Red Cross took it on. So, and how did you come to the UK in the end? How did that? Happen? Well, um, we were we were in the uh, camp for another month. So we were we were liberated. You know, on the, it was on the 9th of May, 1945, and then we were in the camp for another month while they. The, the, the Red Cross started to decontaminate all the buildings. You know, they would seal up a building and then put gas canisters in there to, to get rid of all the bugs. And you know what they used? Zyklon B. Zyklon B. That's the gas, um, ladies That's and gentlemen, right. that the Nazis used to exterminate six million Jews, <laughs> yeah. uh, gay people, gypsies. Um, their, their hatred really knew no bounds. But you, you, how, how, how did you reach this country? Well, then what basically what happened was that um, the, the first people to leave were the Czechs who went back to their houses. And then the Hungarians, they were the first to, to be evacuated as a sort of group. And then it was the Dutch. And there were, we, there were three lots and we were in the second. But my mother was pleading with the Red Cross to go to England because, after all, she was born in England. You know, she was oh, British. Okay, okay. Yeah, she had met my father while she was studying in oh. Holland. So there was a connection. She wanted to get back home because she feared there would be nobody left alive in Holland. Um, but the, the Red Cross said, well, look, there's no, no point in doing that from here. You know, the Russians aren't talking to the Brits. There's no communication. So we were put on, a, on, a, on some sort of transport. I can't remember exactly what it was. And we went to this place called Falkenau or Sokolov, as the, the um, Czechs called it. It was en route to um, Dre um, Pilsen. And we were to be fly from Pilsen back. You've since addressed, I think, 700 
schools? 800. 800 schools with yeah. your testimony. And I was saying during the break to you, um, one, I apologising for how emotional I get about this because it's very difficult sometimes to, to deal with the horror of humanity, but um, how, how much I worry that when uh, the last of your generation pass on, that the Holocaust deniers, uh, who are to many things as evil as the people that did the evil to stuff to you, will be given free reign. And uh, it's just so important, Stephen. I mean, you must worry about the future when you look forward. Do you well, know? so I have tremendous faith in the young people of today. I hear time and time again that um, people say that, that talk that a Holocaust survivor gave in a school is something that they will never forget of all the talks of all the people who come there and talk about various things. The one of the Holocaust survivor is the one that they remember the most. And I find that the effect it has on the kids is amazing. And if I just give you one example, I, mean, I went to an ordinary secondary school um, afterwards, um, Kids do come up to you and ask you questions face to face. And there was a little girl waiting at the end of this queue, patiently waiting to ask a question, which she did. And about a week later, I got an email thanking me from the teacher who had organised it all. And he said, by the way, that little girl at the end of the queue who asked you a question, she is a selective mute. This is the first time ever that she'd wow. asked a question in school. Wow. <laughs> and then you begin to say to yourself, perhaps we will make a difference that we are now bringing into the world a generation who will question Holocaust deniers. Stephen, um, it would be great remiss if we didn't name-check your mother and your father in all of this. I never yeah. asked their names. What, what was my mother's name was Beatrix, and my father's name was Leonard David, yes. And he was very much in the resistance, as I said, yes. Well, I'd very much like to commemorate our little chat to them. And I'd like to thank you from the bottom of our heart for your time and your testimony. And uh, to remind you that it's Holocaust Memorial Day uh, this Sunday. And uh, this interview has been arranged by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. And it's been an absolute pleasure and an honour to talk to you, Stephen Frank. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. Bless you.